good morning. Thanks, you, thanks to everyone for coming today. I really appreciate it. My name is Alice Elliott. I'm the chapter director for Sierra Club Maine. So thanks for being here. Um, <laughs> clap and applause, applause for yourself for being part of the solution. That's what really you should be um, happy about today. So it's my great pleasure to welcome our keynote speaker, Gus Speth, who is, in my, my mind, legendary. I remember hearing and reading some of his work when I was much younger, um, back in the day when I was green and really excited about getting work done in the environment. So it's exciting for me to have him here. Um, he has served on the faculty of the Vermont Law School as professor of law from 2010 to 2015 and is now a fellow at the TELUS Institute, the Democracy, Democracy Collaborative, and the Vermont Law School. Uh, he is co-chair and I believe co-founder of the Next System Project, is that correct? Yes? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at the Democracy Collaborative. In 2009, he completed his decade-long tenure as the dean of the Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. And prior to that, he was administrator of the United Nations Development Program and chair of the UN Development Group. And previously, he was founder and president of the World Resources Institute, professor of law at Georgetown University, chairman of the U.S. Council on Environmental Quality in the Carter administration. Remember those solar panels on the White House? Woo! Woo! Uh, and senior attorney and co-founder of the Natural Resources Defense Council. So please join me in welcoming this amazing person, George Speth, today. George. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction, and what a great group uh, you are, are assembled here today. I've looked over the list of uh, presenters, and I must say it's sort of a who's who and who knows what to do about the climate issue, uh, certainly in the state of Maine. And uh, I commend the Sierra Club here for what it's been able to pull together, and indeed for all the work, uh, some of which I might mention in just a second, uh, that you've pulled off. Uh, so congratulations. Uh, I love the theme uh, for this day. Uh, building thriving communities through climate action. Uh, that brings together a lot of powerful ideas. Um, looking at the program that has been put together for today, I decided two things pretty quickly. One is that I wasn't going to belabor the great risk of climate change. You already get it. You know how serious uh, this threat is. And it really is uh, uh, beyond, I think, most of our comprehension what's going to happen. And it's certainly beyond the thinking uh, that even I have had, and I've worked on this issue since, I'm ashamed to say, uh, because of the progress that hasn't been made since the Carter years, uh, where we did several reports on the climate threat. And um, it's going to be worse than we have ever imagined, I fear, before we get things under control. Uh, but that's just the reality that we have to uh, look forward to. It means that each one of us has to do something and do something big about this issue. I've tried to do several things in, in my life. Um, uh, one is that uh, uh, my wife Cameron and I, who's here, uh, uh, have tried to move to 100% renewable energy. Uh, in our personal lives. Uh, and I've learned a few things. Uh, it's not cheap yet to do that. Uh, and, but uh, we, we've gone to the point where we have everything renewable except um, a Subaru. Uh, and when we get a good four-wheel drive uh, and charging stations, uh, we'll get that the last step. But we love our Chevy Bolt and everything else that we've done so far. I've been working with the uh, Stratford Vermont Energy Committee, and I want you to know that among the things that we've been doing is connecting with wind addresses, uh, which uh, needs no, no introduction. Um, the third area is at the national level. I've been putting in a lot of time on the Juliana lawsuit. And, um, 
exercising my legal uh, talents, such as they are still, a little bit, uh, and helping them out. I did a, an expert report for the case, which is now sort of stuck in a way in the Ninth Circuit, waiting on them to decide. Uh, but um, this was a, an overview of climate action, or inaction, and other actions affecting the climate by the federal government, from the Carter administration up to Trump, and through Trump. And it, was, it took me 450 footnotes uh, to get it written, and it about killed me. They tricked me into doing it. Um, I was um, told to do the Carter administration, which I knew because I had served in it. And they liked it so much, they said, oh, why don't you do all the other administrations too? So I, I did, and, uh, but I'm proud to have, have done it. Um, but um, anyhow, each of you, I know, uh, are doing things already about the, uh, about the climate issue. Um, the other thing I uh, will avoid is going into detail on any of the kind of initiatives that you are the experts on and know so much about uh, what to do. I really want to talk about two somewhat different things. And I have to apologize, I'm going to be sipping on things a good bit this morning because I seem to have encountered uh, some uh, pharmaceuticals. Uh, that uh, don't, I don't know what they do other than dry out your mouth, but they do that very effectively. Uh, um, first thing I want to talk about is I want to encourage you, everybody here, myself included, uh, to a new level of political activism uh, that stretches what you might be used to. Think about how you can up your game in climate demand, climate pressure, climate activism. Um, the, um, nationally, I hope you here in Maine will badger and hound your representatives in Washington, uh, all of those elected representatives, uh, insisting that they put the climate issue at the top of their agendas. Uh, make them really feel it. Uh, regionally, with your new governor in place, hey, um, um, I hope you will join with the other Northeastern and New England states in a variety of regional initiatives because we need to be together in the Northeast and in the region because we're all individually too small for some important things. So on energy, uh, and food, and transport, and banking, and finance, uh, let's forge some regional institutions. And that one thing in particular is that Maine was not in the REGI planning exercise to transform REGI to deal with our biggest problems up here, which is transportation, right? And so now all the other states in the Northeast have joined together to forge and to begin to work on a regional initiative for transportation. And Maine, when it started, was not in that group. And I've been told Maine is still not in that group. So my urging to you is to get Maine in there because 2019 is supposed to be the year they're going to forge this plan to deal with the transportation, initiative, transportation issue on the, uh, on the regional level. And in the statewide, uh, I don't know. I mean, I hope you are impressed as I am uh, by the Maine Green New Deal initiative. Woo! And, I, you know, you have the first AFL-CIO federation in the country to endorse the Green New Deal. Um, and, um, and the Sierra Club of Maine has endorsed it. And I just want to say that what a wonderful way uh, to begin. Go for it. I hope you can make it happen. At the community level, we're going to talk about some things in a minute, but anyhow, the bottom line is I would like to see you carry your activism uh, in these areas and in other areas to be an upstart, to make beautiful trouble, uh, to do whatever you need to do 
to force the climate issue forward. And uh, remember that it really is a proven effectiveness of civic and civil disobedience. And I say that being a jailbird, uh, having spent three, three days, <laughs> three days in the central cell block of the DC jail for a climate protest. Um, the second thing I want to talk about is different. Uh, I would like you to approach your work in the climate area uh, wearing a new uh, uh, chapeau. Ha. Um, to bring a new vantage point uh, to planning climate actions in your communities. What I want you to think about every time you think about a new direction is to think about system change and the need to change the base, some very basic things about our political economic uh, system. And ask every time whether the initiatives that you are pursuing um, are helping to change uh, the system. So what am I talking about here with this system business? Um, after working on this issue since the Carter years, um, I've come to some conclusions about what it's going to take to really deal effectively with it. And with every passing year as the time we have shortens I'm more and more convinced of these conclusions. Um, I, I think that getting this climate job done uh, is going to require some transformations. And I want to read you this little litany of transformations. These are the things that I believe we have to war against, to transform away from. an unquestioning commitment to economic growth at essentially any cost, including the cost of climate disruption. A measure of that growth, GDP, grossly distorted picture. Um, <laughs> this GDP it includes as positives uh, fossil fuel industry growth, new fossil fuel infrastructure, and coping with all the effects of climate change, uh, and much else. Powerful corporate interests whose overriding objective is to generate profit and to grow, including profit from avoiding the cost of climate change, costs that they create. Markets that systematically fail to recognize those costs in prices and otherwise unless corrected by government, but government that's subservient to the corporate interest and wedded to GDP growth for a variety of reasons. And a runaway consumerism spurred endlessly on by sophisticated advertising and gross disparities in status and lifestyle. Social injustice, economic insecurities and concentrations of wealth so vast that they paralyze effective action. That is the depiction of the system that we live and work in. Uh, so I don't think we'll ever be able to go far enough or fast enough or do the right things on climate as long as our systemic priorities are ramping up GDP, growing corporate profits, increasing the incomes of the already well-to-do, neglecting half of America that's just getting by living paycheck to paycheck or worse, feeding our runaway consumerism, focusing only on the present moment, this awful contempocentrism, and facilitating great bastions of corporate power, helping abroad only modestly or not at all, and so on. These are the core underlying problems that climate action is going to face, if not in the first round, where there are things we can do uh, within the current system, thank goodness. Uh, but as we move further down the road towards 
effective action. We've got to deal with these issues. In many of the climate marches I've participated in, there is a banner uh, that always surfaces, uh, and it says, system change, not climate change. And that's where we are. Um, so we have to ask, uh, what are some local actions that we can do that will contribute to system change? It's not an easy question, but I have some answers. Um, first, we really need to utilize new indicators of community well-being and, and, the, and the health of our, 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 the natural world around us and our people in the communities. To get what we measure, we better measure what we want. And we really don't want a lot of GDP growth. What we want is increasing well-being of people in the natural world. And there are indicators springing up all across the country in different communities for doing that. And if the main communities to come together on a sort of unified indicator for measuring community well-being, and perhaps this is going on. Goodness knows I don't know the state well. Um, but um, new, new measures that, that get us away from, from the tyranny of, of, of GDP and, and, and junior GDPs, uh, measures like the Genuine Progress Indicator, uh, which we've worked on in Vermont, and is a good methodology for an aggregate sort of sense of, of dollarized, if you will, uh, progress. But there are many other indicators that are out there that could be adapted for community level measurement. The next few things I want to mention have to do with the basic concept of regaining local control of economic and, and civic life. Control of things that have been wrested away from local communities. I mentioned the system. One of the big things that the system likes is to centralize decision making at the top in New York City, in Washington, D.C., so they can control it. And then the big institutions, the big government. And uh, so we need to wrest this control back. Well, what are some ways of doing that? One area is to build uh, a new ecosystem, if you will, of locally owned and operated enterprise types. Call them businesses, but it's a bigger concept than what we normally think of as business. But it includes business, it includes small business, medium-sized business. But it also includes co-ops of all types, especially worker-owned co-ops. Uh, it includes local and regional public enterprises, including owning your own utility. Um, it includes public-private hybrids profit, not-for-profit hybrids, and new local agricultural enterprises that breathe life into farm-to-plate and other agricultural related objectives. So if you see something that needs doing in your communities, think new co-op, new worker-managed co-ops, new not-for-profit co-ops. One of the one of the good books about the local economy, and I'm going to mention this gentleman a couple of times, and maybe he's been here to speak, is Michael Schumann's uh, book. Uh, he's prolific, among other things, but he has one called The Local Economy Solution. How innovative self-financing pollinator enterprises can grow jobs and prosperity. And those types of enterprises can be directed at climate, climate solutions. Another area, we need to wrest back control as much as we can of banking and finance. Um, you know, it, it, we need to be making the investment decisions. Uh, and they're all made by banks often now, uh, more often than not. And um, so we have credit unions. They could be more, even more focused than they are on, on investing locally and uh, supporting local enterprise. Uh, we probably all could use a state bank. I don't think there's but one in, in the U.S. now, but you know, we sometimes have the effective state bank with a bunch of different funds that could be 
consolidated and put together uh, to deal with some of these issues, including the climate issue, of course. Um, but uh, the basic concept, we all know about local boards. We saw some of us, uh, local boards last night, uh, eating away at the main table. And, uh, but uh, we, we need to see the evolution of, of local vesting, uh, where uh, all of, uh, more and more we're putting our, our savings and our retirement uh, funds uh, into uh, institutions that will invest them locally. And I know some people, if you're interested, who are trying to spawn such institutions. So anyhow, we need to do whatever. Move your money uh, if you can. Uh, the third area is, um, oh, I, oh, and Michael uh, Schumann has another book I brought, uh, Local Dollars, Local Cents. Uh, how to shift your money from Wall Street to Main Street and achieve real prosperity. It's a good idea. I'm beginning to think about how to do it, um, such, as, such as it is. Um, the third area is to wrest uh, control of our energy systems uh, back to local ownership. It's interesting, to, today, publicly owned, democratically governed electric utilities uh, served 28% uh, of the customers in the country. That's a pretty good start. It's higher than I thought. And communities should be trying to see how they can get control of their own energy systems, how they can, we can have public ownership in our communities uh, of, of our utilities. And there are ways, of course, that the state and other measures can facilitate uh, local control what we might call energy democracy. And a lot of people are calling it energy democracy. So, uh, but you have a group that's based partly here in the state um, called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And Stacy Mitchell is here and she's wonderful. Um, and every year they do a, a community empowerment scorecard. And they rank all the states about how empowered the citizens of the state are to control their own electricity uh, systems. And you're thinking, where is Maine, or do you already know? <laughs> I'm going to tell you. Uh, well, uh, there are places at the bottom, um, places like um, some of my favorites, because uh, you say from my accent, I'm not from here. Uh, I love Alabama and Louisiana. If you go, ever go down there, go to Fairhope, uh, go to um, Lafayette. They're at the bottom. At the top, uh, well, as expected, Massachusetts, California, New York, uh, they have the best rules and laws and procedures for citizen empowerment over the system. I'm very happy to say that Vermont is not far down the list. It's about number five. The scale goes from one to 32. Maine, you are 16. You are dead in the middle of the scale. But that, in fact, puts you about two thirds of the way up. Um, but it does suggest you have, this is something to work on, right? Uh, Empower yourselves um, to take back your power. Um, I'm going to leave with you, uh, with the club, I guess, but this is online. As I'm, it was mentioned that I'm associated with something called the Next System Project. It has a wonderful website about these issues, which I had nothing to do with. Um, but um, we did this uh, deck of energy, strat energy democracy cards. And, uh, and it has, I don't think there are 52 here, but there are a lot of, of ideas for enhancing energy democracy at the community and regional level. And these are all online, but there are a host of really good things that can be done at the community level to enhance energy democracy. But I'll leave the hard copy here, but as I said, it's online. Um, 
The last thing I want to mention uh, is um, that um, another area uh, for next system action. I think one of the reasons the Green New Deal took off with such a, a, a liftoff, um, a blast, was its fusion of social goals and environmental goals, its fusion of social justice uh, with climate action. And it was a very powerful fusion. And people were so attracted to that. And, um, and I think this is, an, this is an area that one of the big issues for the future is going to be infrastructure, new, new, new uh, infrastructure designed to cope with climate change, for example, uh, new green infrastructure for various things. And in all these infrastructure developments, you know, we, uh, we have to ask, uh, how do these do investments affect the poor? How do they affect the frontline communities? How do they affect the marginalized peoples and communities? And um, so the consequences of this infrastructure development, it's got to be green, but it's also got to be fair and equitable and, and assist those with marginal capacities to cope and adjust. And then, um, who gets to do the work on the new infrastructure? Is it going to be equitably shared uh, among many communities? Um, who gets to be employed? So I think as we move into this new climate era, there are going to be lots of opportunities to achieve this important fusion of social justice and environmental and, and climate action. Well, that's the last area I, I wanted uh, to mention. Um, I hope these uh, modest thoughts will be helpful to you today, that you'll put on this new shampoo, chapeau as you uh, go into the future and do your work and think about how uh, we can all work together uh, to achieve the beginnings of climate change, and excuse me, the beginnings of system change uh, at the local level and, and building up to, to national action for, for deeper, uh, deeper change. I hope you have a great day today. I hope this is conference lives up to the really high expectations and, and, uh, and it gets all of, all of you and all of us to contribute our, our most to e each other. What you're doing here uh, couldn't be more important. Thank you very much. I've been told uh, that we have a few, few minutes. I don't know how long for some questions, but I'm ha happy to, to try, try them. If you'll put your hands up, Sandy, and I will run with the, with the microphones to you. Hello? We've got one over here. Good morning. Thank you for being here, Gus. My, uh, my first intro introduction to you was this, in, for me now, famous quote, in, inspirational quote, which is that the problem we're facing is not going to be solved with data or with policy, but the crisis we're facing is actually the need for a spiritual revolution. And I'd like to hear your thoughts on how we can bring that into our conference today. Thank you. Oh, is there a preacher here? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, um, I think of it as, as a sort of a transformation of the heart, really, a, a, a new consciousness. I mean, how can we possibly deal with this complexity of issues? And of course, you know, I, I, I would wager that almost everyone here is, is partakes of, of this new consciousness and, uh, and has, uh, uh, has had this spiritual awakening that uh, that we need. 
Uh, I asked one time uh, uh, when I was writing one of my books, some, I asked some uh, psychologist, social psychologist, what would, what would it take to create a sort of convergent ex con conversion experience uh, on a large scale? And I got back a variety of answers, but the common one to almost all of them was a crisis. Uh, you know, that a, a crisis delegitimizes uh, the system delegitimizes what's going on. It makes it makes people think, uh, and that's certainly certainly a big part of it. Um, we're having a crisis now. Uh, it's this kind of a, a chronic chronic crisis, uh, but we're having one, and uh, it shows up all around the country. It shows up on our coastlines. Uh, it shows up in the fisheries. It it's. Uh, and my guess is, I hate to say this, but I think something more dramatic is going to happen before long. It may have to do with all this ice that's melting off of Greenland. And it may have to do with the West Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, or uh, anyhow, I think that will certainly change consciousness, raise consciousness. Uh, social movements. Um, protests, uh, into, uh, actions uh, certainly raise consciousness, make people think. Uh, they have, the young people have transformed downtown London, right? Uh, it's not working anymore, or the bridges. And uh, because of all the young people who've just basically shut down the, the city. Um, we still have the Keystone XL pipeline on the ropes. <laughs> They've announced that they're going to postpone it for another year, thinking about it. And uh, I remember going to jail with McKibben on the first day of that uh, protest. Uh, we didn't know we were going to be there for three days. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyhow, um, that certainly helps raise uh, consciousness. Uh, I think religious institutions have a a way of doing it, of, of, of speaking to people's consciousness, speaking to people's hearts. And we need more and more of that. There is a, a lot now, fortunately, but we need more uh, and more. Um, and um, I could go on. I, I, uh, there are other things, uh, uh, simple, you know, different types of education. Uh, and, um, and the... Um, and, and, uh, but uh, I won't uh, go on. There. So we, it, but it's not something that you just wait about to happen, is, is my point. There, there, there are ways that uh, consciousness can be raised, that consciousness can be transformed. Yes? I have a question over Oops. here. Go ahead. Over here. Um, I was very interested in the educational tool you mentioned, the deck of energy. Um, Democracy cards, where do we find that? The cards, mm -hmm. the energy democracy cards. Well, there'll be a set here with the club, but uh, if you go online, uh, it's um, uh, thenextsystem.org, and uh, you can find them there. Uh, Um, go ahead. That's right. uh, Gus, I appreciate you bringing up Jimmy Carter, and I remember his, you know, the 55 mile an hour speed limit. That was a sacrifice that not many people objected to, and he he said, you know, turn the heat down in federal buildings to 65 and said wear sweaters. Reasonable. So I, I think you know. A big issue is the sacrifices we have to make, uh, individual, corporate, governmental, globally. And, you know, there's a lot we need to do. We have to personally think about, can I fl travel by train instead of air? A whole bunch of different uh, issues. And I don't think Americans at this moment in general are prepared to make sacrifices. And we need to work on that. Thank you. Well, I, I don't quite see a question there, but I agree with what you say. Uh, and um, I would just remind people, 
that in the Carter administration, uh, our little council in the White House, the CEQ, now destroyed by our current president, um, is um, produced three different reports calling for climate action. In 1970, 1980, January 1981. Uh, and um, so we, we knew enough way back then to suggest a prudent upper bound for the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We did it. We suggested the 50%. It's too high, but we suggested it. And it, um, we're about at 50% now. But the point is that. And what this report I did for the Giuliana case shows is that every administration since Carter has been presented with highly credible and in most cases voluminous information about the climate threat. And that every administration, including Carter, did essentially everything they could do to promote fossil fuel use in the country over and over again. And no matter what they said about the climate threat from Clinton, Gore, or Obama, they went whole hog to leasing federal fossil fuel lands offshore, onshore, and everything else that a person, you know, the subsidies. Nobody's taking the subsidies away to this day. Ah, what a bunch. Hi, Gus. It's Roberta Benefiel. And before I left Labrador to come down here to this conference, I wanted to know who you were and what you were all about. So oh, I bought one of your books. I had it sent in from Amazon. And I wanted to know how long you're going to be here today so I can get it signed. <laughs> it's out in the truck. But th that's not all. I, I, I read the book and I knew from the bottom of my heart that you don't agree with um, environmental injustices in the north of Canada where dams are being built consistently uh, where we don't need them and um, sending them down here to be to be claimed green and clean energy. So that I got from your book and I really would love to have you sign it sometime today if you're going to well, be here. I'm I'm flattered. I fear, I fear that there are copies still around. Uh, and uh, I'd be happy to. Um, I saw your sweatshirt you were wearing last night with the mega dams. Uh, I think the, um, well, you know, in Vermont, one of the most progressive proposals for dealing with the climate issues was called the Essex Plan. Uh, and it involves a, a carbon fee and then a rebate, basically, to subsidize electricity use. And the reason is to try to encourage people to use electricity and particularly to go to electric cars. Uh, and the reason is that behind that is that the Vermont um, energy portfolio for the state uh, and certainly for Green Mountain Power, which is the biggest utility, is perceived to be quite green. And so electricity is good. Electricity comes from big dams in Canada. Uh, and uh, so, you know, not so green, right? Uh, but anyhow, that, this is uh, where we are in Vermont. I, would, I see, I would call on hands, but I'm not responsible. Oh, how's that? Many here probably are aware that Jimmy Carter recently shared his observation that the United States is the most war-making country on the planet. I was one of the LBJ25 who was recently arrested at uh, Bath Ironworks. I was, where I was there and committing that action along with others who believe that our war making is uh, uh, the 3,000 pound gorilla on the planet basically. And the Pentagon is responsible for 
70% of the greenhouse emissions in our country, and it has the largest carbon footprint on the planet. So we have launched uh, and did uh, begin our campaign at Bath Ironworks. We've launched a campaign we are calling the Climate Crisis Demands Conversion. We're asking for our, our congressional leaders to lead a movement to convert to systems that are in the interest of our climate uh, and benefiting, benefiting our climate. So I'm uh, anxious for you all to get a, take a look at our conversion brochure, which is in the lobby. And I'd like to hear your observations, uh, Mr. Professor Speth, with regards to the connection between militarism, militarism and climate change. Thank you. Well, I think you're absolutely right to go after uh, the military, the size of the budget, the way that it perverts so many uh, decisions in government. Um, and uh, in one of my books, uh, I, I hate to do this, but in one of them, I uh, uh, can't even remember which one, uh, uh, America the Possible, I have a, uh, I, a chapter that goes into detail into the links between environmental issues and, and the military. Um, uh, it is a, uh, just a, a huge diversion of time and energy and resources away from things that we need to be doing and, and a great source of uh, trouble itself. Uh, so it, we really need to f face that, that issue. Uh, and it's rarely, rarely faced these days. It, was, uh, it had other times in our history where this, it, it came more to the surface uh, than, than it does right now. And I think we need to bring some of that, uh, some of that spirit uh, back uh, into our current activism. Yes. Mr. Gus, thank you so much for your leadership in the World Resources Institute and your books, which inspired me in the 90s to be an environmental advocate. I would like to just let the whole group here know of two efforts underway right now to implement some of the suggestions Gus has made. One is Seth Berry's bill to have a public utility. <laughs> this would create uh, an independent agency, not dependent on the, the uh, main budget, uh, that would use the revenue bonds from the guaranteed income, everybody's got to pay for their power, to pay for the, res the power operation. And uh, CMP and Bangor Hydroelectric and the small co-ops in Eastern Maine, if they wanted to, could all, would all, the big utilities have to be bought out. And the, the co-ops could if they wanted to. Uh, the other thing is very exciting. Uh, farmers in Maine, and we're one of the fast growing areas for young farmers, need large amounts of capital to buy land and buy equipment. And it's not been available in, in the amounts they need. Though we have a lot of credit unions in Maine. There is a virtual credit, cre credit union called Maine Harvest Credit Union opening for depositors this July. It has taken them five or six years to get this in place. Please go to their website and if you have ca free money, invest as a depositor in a CD or a, a bank, um, a, a, a card account with the Maine Harvest Credit Union. Thank you. Awesome. Good morning, Gus. I would like to remind everyone to please ask questions for Gus so that Gus can have a chance to speak because that's what he's oh, here I for. Love, I love these uh, commercials. Um, but uh, Gus, uh, uh. so Gus, in our communities, we. A lot of people want to do something, but we just don't feel any enthusiasm coming from the community as a whole. And also, we actually feel like we're coming up against a wall all the time to actually get something done. Can you speak to the interaction between the local economy and the control over institutions such as the city government and the Chamber of Commerce? I'm not sure I can say a lot that would be that relevant to your particular situations, I, I um, uh, yeah, it, it is a problem, and um, our town, um, you know, struggles to deal with the school and the roads, and uh, to get people 
you know, to do other things is, is, is hard. But, but you know, it, uh, I think so much depends on, on local leadership and, and the spur to get things done. We had a situation in our community where a gentleman decided to come from away, <laughs> uh, to come from Utah, in fact, and to plop down 20,000 people in a new development right in our little towns. Uh, it was going to be a, not a town, but a, a, a corporation, a for-profit corporation. And people were going to have to give up their, uh, their, their uh, personal assets, a lot of them, including their personal transportation, to live in this community where there would be company jobs, company schools, company housing, company stores. And, uh, and it was coming at us full bore. And uh, he had bought... A, a, over 1,500 acres to put this thing into these four little towns. Uh, and we, we got, so we organized, I'm, I'm getting to the point. Uh, um, we organized um, and, um, and, and, and sent him packing in the end. It took over two years. But finally he said that I, I just can't deal with Vermonters. Uh, and um, and he, <laughs> And he, but in the process, it made us start thinking, you know, well, you know, he, had, he at least had a plan, right? I mean, uh, and he had a, a vision, a uh, terribly long-headed vision, but he had a vision. And um, so we, the four towns, got together and said, well, we, we need a vision, and we need a plan, and we need state and other support to get it done. And... Um, so we called upon this group, which you may have the analog of here in Maine, called the uh, Vermont Council for Rural Development. And it's led by a really good group. Uh, and, and they to undertook for the first time a four-town planning exercise with us. And, um, and it's, we're in mid-process with that now. But it really brought these four small towns, a few thousand people each, roughly uh, together and, um, and and we are going to have a sort of regional uh, plan of things that we know that we can do together and this Vermont Council for Rural Development is going to help us access federal and state resources on things that we need because they have all the connections to the state agencies and all and uh, so I say that because you know sometimes what motivates communities is a threat and is the possibility of things getting uh, suddenly worse. And uh, I'm sure that in many of your communities you've uh, encountered these possibilities. Uh, and um, so that can, certainly, uh, that can certainly help. Yes. What makes 2019 so different from the late 80s when chlorofluorocarbons and ozone holes were removed really quick? Well, I've written half a book about that, um, and um, uh, Red Sky and Morning. It turns out that if you think about it, it is, we're at sort of opposite ends of a, of a global problem, opposite ends of a spectrum. Uh, the chlorofluorocarbon issue was a pretty narrow technological question. Uh, it just had to do with substituting one group of chemicals for another group of chemicals. It turned out in the end that DuPont had the alternative chemicals. So they wanted the regulation at the global level that would force their alternative chemicals to be used. So the industry opposition vanished. And uh, you know we have such a problem with the fossil fuel industry in this country blocking action at all levels. I mean, they didn't like the solar where uh, Ohio was going, uh, and so they went out and, and, and uh, you know, basically uh, fought to change the laws in Ohio. It's just the, between the utilities and the fossil fuel industry, uh, you know, we have a huge, huge problem of blocking. So one of the proposals, ah, this will get you sitting up. Uh, one of the proposals that we and others are offering to deal with this problem is to buy out the fossil fuel industry. And um, which one day they may grab hold of, uh, 
very affectionately. Um, and um, but if if uh, it, it if we if we if we did, you know, the, the, the there could be a process of of keeping the remaining fossil resource in the ground, uh, of phasing down uh, fossil fuels, and maybe most important of all, getting them out of the picture politically. Um, I've, I've got a question, Gus. Uh, I'm, I'm here with uh, my student, uh, Alex, from the Watershed School, and I don't see a whole lot of other teenage activists in the room. And um, my question to you is, it seems like the teenage activism in Europe and around the world is the spearhead for actual change. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we continue to, how are we going to move that teenage activism started by Greta Thunberg to the United States? Yeah. Well, this is a good job. Uh, it, it certainly is impressive what's happening in Europe, and I mentioned in London, uh, among other places. Um, I think um, it's happening here. I believe it's happening here. Um, and uh, it may not be as big and dramatic yet, but um, you know, when the Sunrise Movement, who was going to be here? Was it, did I hear that? Uh, they were going to be here. You know, when they show up in Nancy Pelosi's office and, and say, you know, Green New Deal now, uh, that made a difference. And, and there are other, other uh, this group that I work with, the, uh, uh, Our Children's Trust, which is doing all the litigation, our climate, uh, children's climate lawsuit and all, uh, they're very effective. Um, and there are other youth-based uh, groups, I Matter, is another one. Um, maybe people know some of the others. Other. The Rebellion. The Extinction Rebellion is, yeah. And, and so that it's happening. It just needs to, uh, to, to, to sort of get to that explosion point. There's a student march we, in uh, Portland today which took away all the students that we had um, worked with in Augusta last year. So there's, there is a student, uh, they were invited, <laughs> unfortunately they were busy doing something else so, but they are, they are actually having a final march in Portland today. Thank you Gus for being here. Could I give um, a, uh, I, I, I really, uh, really wanted to hear. Thank you Gus for being here. One um, thing that we very seldom talk about, population reduction throughout the world. Yeah. Because without that, we're not going to have the land left to support us. Well, it's a, it is, it's a very serious issue. It used to be part of the environmental discourse in the United States. And, um, and then uh, through some process, uh, because I remember there was, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ZPG, stop it too. I put a notice on my door at the Natural Resources Defense Council that said, uh, uh, I need to engage in a cap and trade process. Uh, uh, because uh, Cameron was getting ready to have our third child and <laughs> I needed to pair with somebody who just wanted one. Uh, uh, but um, it faded. And it became hard to talk about the issue without sounding like border vigilantes. Uh, but it's an issue in our country. Uh, it's an issue abroad. Um, what we found in the UN was that, um, it, it, not just in the UN, but if you, if you combine maternal and child health care initiatives, uh, the rights of women and the employment of women, uh, the education what, of what the UN called the girl child, uh, and non-coercive family planning services, uh, you know, fertility rates declined, uh, and sometimes dramatically. And, um, uh, and so it is a huge issue. We put a funding number on what those initiatives would cost in the Cairo Planning uh, Population Conference in the early 80s, uh, mid 80s. and. Uh, the, the governments of the world have never funded it at that level. And the U.S. has been a terrible funder 
because every time a conservative administration comes into power, they conflate this issue, uh, you know, with the uh, uh, right to life uh, uh, issue, and, um, and, and we stop funding the UN population programs and, and all. So it's been a terrible situation politically, I think, and, and is now just right now not much discussed. Meanwhile, this so-called Mexico City policy, which cuts back U.S. funding for international groups, uh, is, is back in place, as I understand it. You might have missed that among a few other things that are going on in Washington. Uh, one more question and then I've got, I want to I was just going to say, I want to give a, a shout out to, to Becky who Go ahead. spent a lot of uh, time, uh, among other things. Uh, uh, Gene Matlock here. You mentioned Christ, that you thought it would take a crisis for us to really, and I, I agree with you. Um, crisis creates the urgent need for finding capacities we didn't know we had. Would you talk about how you see that crisis emerging? Because I do think it's beginning to register. Well, I, I, I did say a couple of things about the, the nature of the crisis. It, you're right now, I do think we have a crisis, but it's uh, it kind of has a, uh, it's chronic and it has multiple manifestations, and and people don't know quite how to put it together. Uh, and I, I mentioned that I think that, that there's um, it's that, that's this whole issue of uh, of loss of ice, um, an ice-free Arctic, which won't affect sea level directly. But, uh, but other things uh, like the uh, ice sheets melting uh, in Greenland and Ar Antarctica will affect uh, sea level. So it could come in that area. Um, it could come in even worse uh, storms uh, of different types, uh, uh, both floods and droughts and fires. And, um, and we had a lovely beach house in South Carolina, which we sold. Mm -hmm. we, we're getting out of there. Mm -hmm. I mean, and I think a lot of people will. Now they'll move to Maine. You understand that. <laughs> I think one of the reasons the, the kids are getting active is that they understand that there's a crisis. It's their future. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, and um, that's, uh, you know, if you have a chance, listen to some of the videos, the short little YouTube segments that the... Uh, Juliana lawsuit plaintiffs have, the kids have made, and uh, they're, 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 they are very concerned. 